Evening everybody. I hope you having a lovely evening. Um, I'm going to start a book um, that I grew up on. It's a true story that comes from Africa. Okay. Um, I grew up on being read the story and then later on reading it myself. There's a whole series of it. I've just managed to get the one. Okay. Um, it's a book called Born Free, written by Joy Adamson. It's about a, a lioness and um, her life with the Adamsons. Right. The preface. Where the fact or fiction lies at the root of tales which credit the Assyrians with having trained lions as cheaters, greyhounds or retrievers are today trained to hunt in cooperation with man. The Adamsons can certainly claim to be the first for several thousand years to have made an approach to achieving that result with a lioness, and that, not by any deliberate attempt to do so, but merely by allowing the animal to grow up in their company and never allowing her nature to be subjected to the strains of being confined in any way. The history of their lioness, Elsa, reared from earliest infancy to three years old and finally, finally, finally returned to the wild life, forms a unique and illuminating study in animal psychology a subject to which the last half century has seen a wholly new approach, partly, no doubt, in revolt against the tendency of 19th century writers to attribute to animals anthropomorphic qualities of intelligence, sentiment and emotion. The 20th century has seen the development of a school of thought according to which the springs of animal behavior are to be sought in the terms of conditioned reflexes, release mechanisms, and the rest of a wholly new vocabulary, which is regarded as the gateway to a, clearly, a clearer understanding of animal psychology. To another way of thinking which cannot reconcile that mechanical concept conception with the diverse character, intelligence and capabilities exhibited by different individuals of the same species. That gateway to understanding seems as far removed from truth as the anthropomism of a previous generation and a more apt and more apt to raise a further barrier to a sympathetic, sympathetic understanding of animal behavior than a revelation of it. To whatever way of thinking the reader of Elsa's history may lean, it provides a record of absorbing interest depicting the it provides a record of absorbing interest depicting the gradual development of a controlled character which few would have credited as possible in the case of an animal potentially as dangerous as any in the wild. That such a creature, when in a highly excited state, with her blood up after a long struggle with a bull buffalo, and while still on top of it, should have permitted a man to walk up to her and cut the dead beast's throat to satisfy his religious scruples, and then lend her assistance in pulling the carcass out of a river is an astonishing tri tribute, no less to her intelligence than to her self-control. If the most fanciful author of animal stories of the 19th century had drawn the imaginary character of a lioness acting in that manner, it would assuredly have been ridiculed as altogether out of character and to improbable to carry conviction, and yet Elsa's record shows that it is no more than sober fact. If her, if her development, Elsa has made her own commentary 
both on the anthropomorphism of the 19th century and the science of the 20th century. She has not lived in vain. And that was written by William Percy. Right, now on to the story. Chapter 1. Cub Life. For many years my home has been in the northern frontier province of Kenya. That vast stretch of semi-arid thornbush covering some 120,000 square miles which extends from Mount Kenya to the Abyssinian border. Civilization has made little impact on this part of Africa. There are no settlers. The local tribes live very much as their forefathers did, and the place abounds in wildlife of every description. My husband, George, is senior game warden of this huge territory, and our home is on the southern border of the province, near Isiolo a small township of about 30 whites, all of whom are government officials engaged in the task of administrating the territory. George's many duties, such as enforcing the game laws, preventing poaching and dealing with dangerous animals that have molested the tribesmen. His work causes him to travel over tremendous distances. These journeys we call safaris. Whenever it is possible, I accompany my husband on such trips, and in this way I have had unique opportunities of coming to grips with this wild, unchanged land where life is tough and nature asserts her own laws. This story has its beginning on one of these safaris. A Boran tribesman had been killed by a man-eating lion. It was reported to George that this animal, accompanied by two lionesses, was living in some nearby hills, and so it became his duty to track them down. This was why we were camping far to the north of Isolo, among the Boran tribesmen. Early on the morning of the 1st of February 1956, I found myself in camp alone with Patty, a rock hyrex. Okay, now stop there a bit. A rock hyrex in... Um, common everyday language in Africa is called a dussy. It looks kind of like a gopher, kind of like that, but it doesn't live in a hole. It lives up in the 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 um, mountains and the hills. We call them copies here. Okay, it lives amongst the rocks. Okay, so I'll start it again. Early on the morning of the 1st of February 1956, I found myself in camp alone with Patty, a rock hyrax, who has been living with us as a pet for six and a half years. She looked like a marmot or a guinea pig. Yeah, you could say that, but bigger. Those zoologists will have it that on account of the bone structure of its feet and teeth, the hyrax is most nearly related to rhinos and elephants. And that really makes you want to laugh because, I mean, you look at the size of a rhino and you look at the size of an elephant and then you look at the size of this little dussy. Kind of funny. Patty snuggled her soft fur against my neck and from the safe position watched all that went on. The country around us was dry with outcrops of granite and only sparse vege vegetation. All the same, there were animals to be seen, for there were plenty of geranook, and other gazelles. These are gazelles. Different gazelles. Creatures that have adapted themselves to these dry conditions and rarely, if ever, drink. If you not want to know what these animals look like, okay, just Google them and then you'll, you'll see. Suddenly I heard the vibrations of a car. This could only mean that George was returning much earlier than expected. Soon our Land Rover broke broke through the thorn bush and stopped near our tents they lived in tents eh? they didn't live in houses or uh, cabins or anything like that they lived in tents and i heard george shout joy where are you quick i have something for you 
I rushed out with Patty on my shoulder and saw the skin of a lion. But before I could ask about the hunt, George pointed to the back of the car. There were three lion cubs, tiny balls of spotted fur, each trying to hide its face from everything that went on. They were only a few weeks old and their eyes were still covered with bluish film. They could hardly crawl. Nevertheless, they tried to creep away. I took them on my lap to comfort them, while George, who was most distressed, told me what had happened. Towards dawn, he and another game warden, Ken, had been guided near to the place where the man-eater was said to lie up. When first light broke, they were charged by a lioness who rushed out from behind some rocks. Though they had no wish to kill her, she was very close, and the way back was hazardous. So George signalled to Ken to shoot. He hit and wounded her. The lioness disappeared, and when they went forward, they found a heavy trail of blood leading upwards. Cautiously, step by step, they went over the crest of the hill till they came to a huge flat rock. George climbed onto it to get a better view, while Ken skirted around below. Then he saw Ken peer under the rock, pause, raise his rifle, and fire both barrels. There was a growl. The lioness appeared and came straight at Ken. George could not shoot, for Ken was in his line of fire. Fortunately, a game scout who was in a more favorable position fired his rifle and caused the animal to swerve. Then George was able to kill her. She was a big lioness in the prime of life, her teeth swollen with milk. It was only when he saw this that George realized why she had been so angry and faced them so courageously. Then he blamed himself for not having recognized earlier that her behavior showed that she was defending her litter. Now he ordered a search to be made for the cubs. Presently, he and Ken heard slight sounds coming out of a crack in the rock face. They put their arms down the crevice as far as they could reach. Loud infantile growls and snarls greeted this unsuccessful maneuver. Next, they cut a long hooked stick and after a lot of prodding, ma managed to drag the cubs out. They could not have been more than two or three weeks old. They were carried to the car where the two biggest growled and spat during the whole of the journey back to the camp. The third and smallest, however, offered no resistance and seemed quite unconcerned. Now the three cubs lay in my lap, and how could, how could I resist making a fuss of them? To my amazement, Patty, who was usually very jealous of any rival, soon came to, the, to nestle among them and obviously accepted them as desirable companions. From, the day, from that day onwards, the four became inseparable. During these early days, Patty was the biggest of the company, and also being six years old, was, a very, digni was very dignified, compared with the clumsy little velvet bags who couldn't walk without losing their balance. It was two days before the cubs accepted their first milk. Until then, whatever trick I tried to make them swallow diluted unsweetened ideal milk only resulted in their pulling up their tiny noses and protesting. Nuk, nuk, nuk. Very much as we did as children, before we had learned better manners and been taught to say, No, thank you. Once they had accepted the milk, they could not get enough of it, and every two hours I had to warm it and clean the flexible rubber tube which we had taken from the wireless set to serve as a teat, until we were able to get a proper baby's bottle. We had sent at once to the nearest African market, which was about 50 miles away, not only for the teat, but also for cod liver oil, glucose, and cases of unsweetened milk, and had at the same time sent an SOS to the district commissioner at Izolo, about 150 miles away, announcing the arrival there within a fortnight of three royal babies, asking him to be good enough to have a comfortable wooden home made in time for our return. 
Within a few days, the cubs had settled down and were everybody's pets. Patty, their most con conscientious, self-appointed nanny, remained in charge. She was devoted to them and never minded being pulled and trodden on by the three fast-growing little bullies. All the cubs were females. Even at this age, each had a definite character. The big one had a benevolent superiority and was generous towards the others. The second was a clown, always laughing and spanking her milk bottle with both her front paws as she drank. Her eyes closed in bliss. I named her Latika, which means the jolly one. The third cub was the weakling in size, but the pluckiest in spirit. She pioneered all round and was always sent by the others to, re to recon when something looked suspicious to them. I called her Elsa because she reminded me of someone that name. In the natural course of events, Elsa would probably have been the throw out of the pride. The average number of cubs in a litter is four, of which one usually dies soon after birth and another is often too weak to be reared. It is for this reason that one usually sees only two cubs with a lioness. Their mother looks after them till they are two years old. For the first year she provides their food. She regurgitates it, thus making it acceptable to them. During the second year the cubs are allowed to take part in the hunting, but they get severely disciplined if they lose their self-control since at this time they are unable to kill on their own. They have to rely for their food on what may be left over from a kill by the full-grown lions of the pride. Often little remains, very little remains for them, so they are usually in a bad, scruffy condition at this age. Sometimes they can't bear the hunger, then either they break through the line of gorging adults and are likely to be killed, or they leave the pride in small groups, and because they do not yet know how to kill properly, oft, often run into trouble. Nature's law is harsh, and lions have to learn the hard way from the beginning. The quartet, Patty and the three cubs, spent most of the day in the tent under my camp bed. This evidently seemed to them a safe place, and the nearest thing they could find to their natural nursery. They were by nature house trained and always took great care to reach the sand outside. There were a few accidents during the first days, but afterwards on the rare occasions when a little pool disgraced their home, they meowed and made comical grimaces of disgust. In every way they were wonderfully clean and had no smell except for the very pleasant one like honey. Or was it cod liver oil? Their tongues were already rough as sandpaper. As they grew older, we could feel them, even through our khaki clothes, when they licked us. When, after two weeks, we returned to Izolo, our royal babies had a palace awaiting them. Everyone came to see them, and they received a royal welcome. They loved Europeans and especially small children, but had a marked dislike of Africans. The only exception was a young Somali called Nuru. He was our garden boy. Now we appointed him guardian and lion keeper in chief. The post pleased him for it raised his social status. It also meant that when the cubs got tired of romping all over the house and its surroundings and preferred to sleep under some shady bush, he was able to sit near them for long hours, watching to see that no snakes or baboons molest molested them. For 12 weeks we kept them on a diet of unsweetened milk mixed with cod liver oil, glucose, bone meal and a little salt. Soon they showed us that they only required three hourly feeds and then gradually the intervals became longer. By now their eyes were fully opened but they could not yet judge distances and often missed their target. To help them over this difficulty we gave them rubber balls and old inner tubes to play with. The latter were perfect for tug-of-war games. Indeed, anything made of rubber or that was soft and flexible fascinated them. 
They would try to take the inner tube from each other, the attacker rolling sideways onto the possessor, pressing her weight between the end of the tube and its owner. If no success was achieved by this method, the rivals would simply pull with all their might. Then, when the battle had been won, the victor would parade with the trophy in front of the others and provoke an attack. If this invitation was ignored, the rubber would be placed in front of their noses, while the owner pretended to be unaware that it might be stolen from her. Surprise was the most important element in all their games. They stalked each other, and us, from the earliest age, and knew by instinct how to do it properly. They always attacked from the rear. Keeping under cover, they crouched, then crept slowly towards the unsuspecting victim, until the final rush was made at flying speed and resulted in the attacker landing with all her weight on the back of her quarry, throwing it to the ground. When we were the object of such an attack, we always pretended to be unaware of what was going on. Obligingly, we crouched down and looked the other way until the final onslaught took place. This delighted the cubs. Patty always wanted to be in the game, though, as the cubs were soon three times her size, she took good care to keep out of the way of heavy spankings and to avoid being squashed by her charges. In all other circumstances, she retained her authority by sheer character. If the cubs became too aggressive, she put them in their places by just turning round and facing them. I admired her spirit. For small as she was, it needed a lot of courage to convince them of her fearlessness. The more so that, she o that her only defences were her sharp teeth, quick reactions, intelligence and pluck. She had come to us when she was newly born and had entirely adapted her life to ours. Unlike her cousin, the tree hyrax, she was not a nocturnal animal and at night she would sleep round my neck like a fur. She was a vegetarian, but had a craving for alcohol and for the strongest spirits at that. Whenever the opportunity arose, she would pull the bottle over, extract the cork and swig the liquor, as this was very bad for Paddy's health, not to mention her morale. We took every precaution to prevent any indulgence in whiskey or gin. Her excretory habits were peculiar. Rock hyrexes always use the same place, for preference the edge of a rock. At home, Patty invariably perched herself on the rim of the lavatory seat, and thus situated, presented a comical sight. On safari, where no such refinements were provided for her, she was completely bewildered, so we had eventually to rig up a small lavatory for her. I never found a flea or a tick on her, so at first I was puzzled by a habit of constantly scratching herself. She had round toenails, like those of a miniature rhino, or her, on her well-padded feet, four toes in front and three behind. On the inner toe of her hind legs there was a claw known as the grooming claw. With this sh she used to keep her fur sleek, and her care for her coat explained her constant scratchings. Patty had no visible tail. She had a gland along the middle of her spine, which was visible as a white patch in her otherwise brindled grey fur. This gland discharged, discharged a secretion, and the hair round it used to rise when she became excited by pleasure or alarm. As the cubs grew larger, her hair stood up all too frequently, owing to the fear which their playful but rough antics caused her. Indeed, had she not always been quick to seek refuge on, on a windowsill, a ladder, or some other high object, she would often have been in danger of being mistaken by them for a rubber ball. Until the cubs came, Patty had always been number one among our pets, so I was very touched that she should continue to love the little rascals, even though they diverted our visitors' attention from her. As the lions became increasingly aware of their strength, they tested it on everything they could find. For instance, 
a ground sheet, however large, had to be dragged about and they would set to work in proper feline fashion, placing it under their bodies and pulling it between their front legs, as in later life they would drag a kill. Another favourite game was King of the Castle. A cub would jump on to a potato sack and keep her attacker at bay until she was suddenly dethroned by the other sister coming up from behind. The victor was usually Elsa, who, seeing the other two locked in combat, made the most of her opportunity. A few banana trees were also regarded as delightful toys, and very soon their luxuriant leaves hung in tattered fringes. Tree climbing was another favourite game. The little lions were born acrobats, but after they ventured so high that they could not turn to come down, and we were obliged to rescue them. When at dawn, Nuru let them down. They shot out of doors, let them out. Read that again. When at dawn, Nuru let them out. They shot out of doors with a whole night's pent-up energy. And this moment could be compared to the start of a greyhound race. On one such occasion, they spotted a tent in which two men who had come to visit us were staying. Within five minutes, it was a wreck and we were awakened by the cries of our guests, who were vainly trying to rescue their belongings, while the cubs, wild with excitement, dived into the wreckage and reappeared with a variety of trophies, slippers, pajamas, shreds of mosquito netting. We had to enforce discipline that time with a small stick. Putting them to bed was also no mean task. Imagine three very naughty little girls who, like all children, hated bedtime, but who could run twice as fast as those who were in charge of them and had the added advantage of being able to see in the dark. We were often obliged to resort to servitude, subterfuge. One very successful trick was to tie an old bag to a length of rope and drag it steadily towards them and then into the pen. Usually they could not resist chasing it. Outdoor games were all very well, but the cubs also developed a fancy for books and cushions. So to save our library and other possessions, we were eventually obliged to ban them from the house. To effect this, we made a shoulder-high door of strong wire on a wooden frame and placed it across the entrance to the veranda. The cubs resented it very much. So to compensate them for their lost playground, we hung a tire from a tree, and this prov proved to be grand for chewing and also as a swing. Another toy we gave them was an empty wooden honey barrel, which made a resounding boom when it was pushed. But best of all was a hessian bag. We filled it with old inner tubes and tied it to a branch, from which it dangled invitingly. It had another rope attached to it, and when the cubs hung on the bag, we pulled and swung them high up in the air. The more we laughed, the better they enjoyed the game. Yet none of these toys caused them to forget that there was at all times a barrier in front of the veranda, and they often came and rubbed their soft noses against the wire. Late one afternoon, some friends had arrived for a sundowner. Intrigued by the sounds of the merriment inside, the cubs soon turned up. But that evening they behaved in a disciplined fashion. There was no nose rubbing against the wire. All three kept a foot away from it. This exemplary conduct aroused my suspicion. So I got up to investigate its cause. To my horror, I saw a large red spitting cobra between the cubs and the door. In spite of the presence of three lions on one side and of ourselves on the other, it wriggled determinedly across the veranda steps, and by the time we had fetched a shotgun, it had disappeared. No barricades, cobras, or prohibitions made Litsika give up her intention of entering the house. Repeatedly she tried all the doors. Pressing a handle proved easy enough. Even turning a knob could be done. Only when we quickly fitted bolts all round was she defeated, and even so I once caught her trying to push the bolt aside with her teeth. 
thought it in her purpose. She had her revenge upon us, for about this time she tore the laundry off the clothesline and galloped off into the bush with it. When the cubs were three months old, they had teeth big enough to make it possible for them to eat meat. So now I gave them raw mince meat, which was the best we could do to imitate their mother's regurgitated food. For several days they refused to touch it, to touch it and pulled grimaces of disgust. Then the Tsika made the experiment and found it to her taste. The others took courage from her, and soon there was a fight at every meal. This meant that poor Elsa, who was still weaker than the others, had little chance of getting her fair share. So I kept the tidbits for her and used to take her onto my lap for her meals. She loved this, rolling her head from side to side and closing her eyes. She showed how happy she was. At these times she would suck my thumbs and massage my thighs with her front paws as though she were kneading her mother's belly in order to get more milk. It was during these hours that the bond between us developed. We combined playing with feeding, and my days were happily spent with these charming creatures. They were lazy by nature, and it needed a lot of persuasion to get them to move from a comfortable position. Even the most desirable marrow bone was not worth the effort of getting up, and they would roll in position to get at it by the easiest way. But best of all, they liked me to hold their bone for them while they lay on their backs, paws in the air and sucked at it. When the cubs went into the bush, they often had adventures. One morning I was following them, for I had given them a worming powder and wished to see the result. I saw them a little way off asleep. Suddenly I noticed a stream of black soldier ants approaching them. Indeed, some were already climbing up their bodies. Knowing how fiercely these ants will attack anything that lies in their path, and how powerful their mandibles are, I was just about to wake the cubs up when their ants changed their direction. Soon afterwards, five donkeys approached, and the cubs woke up. This was the first time they had seen such big animals, and they certainly showed the proverbial courage of a lion, for they all charged simultaneously. This put them into such good heart that when a few days later our forty-pack donkeys and mules came near the house, the three little lions fearlessly put the whole cavalcade to flight. At five months they were in splendid condition and getting stronger every day. They were quite free except at night, when they slept in an enclosure of rock and sand, which led off from their wooden shelter. This was a necessary precaution, for wild lions, hyenas, jackals and elephants frequently, frequently roam round our house, and any of these might have killed them. The more we grew to know the cubs, the more we loved them, so it was hard to accept the fact that we could not keep forever three fast-growing lions. Regretfully, we decided that two must go, and that it would be better that the two big ones, who were always together and less dependent on us than Elsa, should be the ones to leave. Our African servants agreed with our choice. When asked their opinion, they unanimously chose the smallest. Perhaps they were influenced by visions of the future and thought, if there must be a lion in the household, then let it be as small as possible. As to Elsa, we felt that if she had only ourselves as friends, she would be easy to train, not only for life at Izolo, but also as a travelling companion on our safaris. As a home for Litsika and the big one, we chose the Rotterdam Blydorp Zoo and made arrangements for them to make the journey by air. Soon, Since they would have to leave from the Nairobi airfield, which was 180 miles away, we decided to get them accustomed to motoring and took them for short daily trips in our one and a half ton truck, which had a wired box body. We also began to feed them in it so that they might get used to it and consider it as one of their play pens. On the last day, we padded the car with soft sandbags. When we drove off, Elsa ran a short way down the drive, 
and then stood with the most mournful expression in her eyes, watching the car in which her two sisters were disappearing. I travelled in the back with the cubs and had armed myself with a small first aid kit, fully expecting to be scratched during the long journey. However, my medical precautions were put to shame, for after an hour of restlessness, the cubs lay on the bags beside me, embracing me with their paws. We travelled like this for eleven hours, delayed by two blowouts. The lions could not have been more trusting. When we reached Nairobi, they looked at me with their large eyes, puzzled to know what to make of all the strange noises and smells. Then the plane carried them off forever from their native land. After a few days we received a cable announcing the safe arrival of our cubs in Holland. When I visited them about three years later, they accepted me as a friendly person and allowed me to stroke them, but they did not recognize me. They live in splendid conditions, and on the whole I was glad to know that almost certainly they had no recollection of a freer life. Okay, we'll end there. That's the end of chapter one. I hope everybody will enjoy this. Okay, don't forget that was written at, in, a, in 1956. It was a completely time, different time then in Africa. So just bear that in mind. Okay. I hope you enjoyed this. Let me know. See you again on the next one. May your gods go with you. Take care.